in Jesus' name. I understand this is a leaders meeting. It's a great privilege to be here to speak with the leaders. Uh, I'm still waiting for my friend. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I want to say I, I thank the leaders of the ministry for the privilege. I know what it means to get a minister to speak to your leaders and I accept this responsibility with fear and trembling, <laughs> trusting that God will make grace available. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we give you praise, we give you glory, we thank you in this time uh, that you are kindling a revival from this nation. Uh, we submit ourselves to align with your strategy and we ask that you empower every one of us to this end in the name of Jesus. Let the glow of your grace rest upon this minister's meeting and let everyone be energized and equipped for the work of the ministry in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please, you may be seated. The topic I was given this morning is distinguishing yourself as a member of the army of God. So what do you do to distinguish yourself, to set yourself apart, so that it will be evident that the grace of God is on your life? We'll take an introductory scripture from the book of Joel chapter number 2. Joel chapter number 2. And um, we'll proceed from that point. Joel chapter number 2. This seems to be the scripture that gives us a very graphic perspective of the army of God. And I'd like us to look at it um, in detail. And then we will see the symptoms of the oppressions. And pick out a few things that we will amplify. I trust that God will help us in Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spreads upon the mountains a people and a strong there had not been ever the like neither shall there be any more after it even to the years of many generations the fire devoured before them and behind them a flame burned it the land is as the garden of eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness and ye, nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is like the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains, shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people were much pained, all faces shall gather blackness, and they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his, his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. I don't think we can take much more than what we just read. So let's limit, limit. If, if we, hallelujah. Now from verse four, because we are Bible people, I don't need to give you any background. From verse 4, we begin to see the metaphors that were used to unveil, to reveal the army of God. And the metaphor that was used here are horses. He said like the appearance of them is like the appearance of horses. That's the metaphor. And like horsemen, so shall they run. That's the first kind of horse. That's the race horse. Like the noise of the chariots on the tops of the mountains. That's the, on the tops of the mountains, that's the show horse. 
like the noise of fire that burned the stubble. That's the, um, the wild horse, the stallion. Like a people set in battle array, that's the fourth kind of horse, which is the war horse. So the actual appearance of the army of God in this progression of revelation in Joel chapter 2 begins from verse number 4. But you see, because of the topic I was given, we will need to focus on a certain verse in the area of revelations about the um, army of God. So my emphasis will now be verse 7, and then from there, we can pick what we need to do to distinguish ourselves as members of this great army. Prophecy is upon us. The season that our ancestors prophesied about is upon us. And there is obviously going to be a spiritual awakening that will have its bearing from the Nigerian church. So the, it, it, the, there is a new configuration that God is setting up in the midst of the Nigerian church in order for us to be such functionaries that God will use to fill the gap of missionary manpower. In uh, verse 7, where my emphasis is, you will begin to see their modus operandi, the way they function, the way they work. And when we see that, we can identify a few symptoms in their ways that will build upon in a moment of time. The Bible says that they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways. That's where I'm going. They shall march everyone on his ways. In, in terms of their tact, in terms of their skill, in terms of their training, they are impeccable. However, however, these people that are part of God's army, the Bible says they shall march everyone in his own ways. It means that even though they are part of a team, each and every one of them understands the gates unto which he has been appointed. So the first thing that we need to look at here, in order for you to operate and distinguish yourself in the layout of this army, um, you will need to have a very good understanding of your spiritual identity. Because the Bible says that they shall mark Match everyone in his own ways, and just to add, and they shall not break their ranks. It, it's, it's a lot of technology that is involved in that scripture. So the first thing we need to do this morning is to find out how you are different from the next person sitting close to you, because that is going to impact upon the nature of service delivery that you can bring to the table. How are you different from the next person by your side. If you check um, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, there were three major issues that were raised in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The first major issue is the issue of gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 4 is the stem of that chapter. And when we talk about the stem, that's where all the branches derive. That's where all the discussion derives. So if you understand the stem of a certain scripture, then you can flow in the build-up that becomes the branches of the teaching, the branches of the emphasis. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Verse 4, there are diversities of administration, but the same Lord. 4, there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God that worketh all in all. You see, when we go to the functionality of the army of God, our diversity is critical. Because that's how God runs his body. Like, for instance, my wife is an introvert. She doesn't talk much. She, she, she observes a lot and all of that. I don't need to tell you how I am. But, but we are not the same. We are not the same. <laughs> and you see, in this, our tag team, our diversities have been our saving grace. 
we have different kinds of operations, different kinds of, 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 of possibilities that are tied to our diversity. So it is needful for you to understand your identity within the broader framework of that which God is doing. You see, when we go to um, that first Corinthians chapter 12, when we move to chapter 8, you'll begin to see the functionality of the body and you'll find out that the principle that sustains the body of Christ is actually the principle of interdependence and not independence. The reason why I will need to depend on you is because you have something that I don't have that I need. So that, that, that diversity becomes the, the secret behind our effectiveness because we have different kinds of graces flowing through uh, the membrane of life, the membrane of our formation as an army of God. So in view of the above, we will need to pick out what makes you you in God because we are not the same. And our father likes the idea of diversity. Hallelujah. In my own opinion, my wife is the only woman I can marry because sometimes when things become intense and I begin to pressed into God, I become quiet for days. And when I become quiet, then she now starts talking. I don't know how God... <laughs> All right, let's take a scripture quickly. Let me introduce um, identity. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Now, in the matter of identity, your clearance level in the spirit is part of your identity. Your, the measure of anointing that you carry is part of your, your identity. The nature of anointing that you carry is part of your identity. And your assignment is part of your identity. But I need to show you what happens when a man doesn't know his identity. And he's just part of a team. The team is functioning. The team is productive corporately. The team is productive, but it's very easy for you to hide in the shadows of a productive team and not get to maximize what is upon your life. What you are doing is that you are cheating us. You are cheating the body. And so we'll need to bring this thing close up on everyone that is here. Are you there in the book of John chapter 1 verse 22? Then said they unto him, who art thou? This is John the Baptist and they had watched him. You see, the Jews are not a bunch of ignorant people. They have prophecies. They have precepts. They have all kinds of clues that God had given them because of the nature of the priesthood that is in their land. So when you begin to manifest, they want to compromise you with existing pro prophecies. They want to compromise your life with existing possibilities that were captured in the previous dealings of God. It was on the strength of that that they came to John the Baptist and said, who are you? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What said thou of thyself. You see, are you with me? So even though we are part of a functional army and a vibrant ministry, we want to ensure that each and every one of us maximizes his possibility in the grace of God and that will add to our body of impact, to add to our body of productivity. Now this is John's answer. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as say the prophet Isaiah. Unfortunately, this revelation that John gave about himself is a revelation he received about his ministry. There was more to him than what he received, unfortunately. When we go to the book of Luke chapter 1 from verse 13 to 17, you are going to see the encounter that his father had before he was conceived and a full syllabus of what his essence will be was unveiled. You see, um, it was in that disclosure that the father was told that John the Baptist was going to operate in the spirit and in the power of the prophet Elijah. Unfortunately, the father never bothered to inform John the Baptist about who he was. So when he was asked, because there were questions. They said, are you that prophet? 
talking about whether he was the Messiah. They asked him, are you Elijah? Because according to the prophetic timetable, Elijah was supposed to come first before the Messiah comes. So they wanted to put this, his, this, this rising, the rising of John the Baptist within the framework of the schedule. John the Baptist did not know that he was Elijah because his father did not tell him. So there was an identity issue that was, that was on the line for John the Baptist. And the implication of the identity crisis that John had was now revealed in the book of John chapter 10 verse 41. Are you still with me? Yes. Now, in, in Luke chapter 1 from verse 13 to 17, you will see that the Bible says he will go before him or before the Messiah in the spirit and in the power of Elijah the prophet. Unfortunately, in John chapter 10 verse 41, can you help me quickly? Quickly. Oh my. And many resorted to him and said, John did no miracle. John was supposed to move in the spirit of Elijah and in the power of Elijah. But because he lacked identity of who he was, he fulfilled what God revealed to him. He did not fulfill what God revealed to his father. So he moved in the spirit of Elijah, but never moved in the power of Elijah. Now, should I say something? God will not tell you what he has told your spiritual father. Let me, let me, let me... <laughs> Let me stop. There. I don't want to punch you. <laughs> he will not, he's not under obligation to, to replay what he has told your spiritual father. So John operated with that deficiency throughout his ministry and he did not maximize his measure. I believe that the objective of my session is to put the cards on the table so that each and every one of us, even though we are in a successful ministry, can maximize our potential. So when we journey into this identity discovery, um, the first thing we need to talk about here is your assignment. Your assignment. You see, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and the things that the Gentiles seek will be added to you. See, in the kingdom, there are things that are majors. There are things that are electives. Electives can be added, but majors from the substance of your pilgrimage. So you say, the things of the kingdom are not available at face value. They are not common things, so you need to seek them. All right? You need to seek them. You look like every other person the time you give your life to Christ, every other believer. But when you begin to press into the kingdom of God, God begins to give you an insight into your identity as it has to do with your assignment. And when I talk about your assignment, I'm not, I'm not referring to the fact that you're an usher. That's your, your service line. Your service line may be different from your assignment. For instance, we have, there is this widow in our ministry I, I was there to encourage her when she lost her husband and all of that. And then I, I taught her prayer. Having taught her prayer, she now picked up. And I now discovered that she has grace to pray more than myself. Do you understand? Yes. There, there, there's something she does, okay? She's in a group. But that's not her assignment. That's, that's her responsibility to the house. Yeah. Her assignment is that she's an intercessor called to pray for me. That's her assignment. You might be in a group, but you are not fulfilling your assignment. Yes, yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. Uh, sometimes she goes on fasting for, dry fasting for, when she hits like 17 days, I will drive to her house and say, okay, stop there, you fast. No? Is it not me you are uh, praying for? <laughs> stop. Yeah, so there are people like that. They know their assignment because every priest must know the gate to which it's appointed. You know, if you know your assignment, this thing about competition, trying, no, you see, it, you, it will just, it will just, it will just, you know. So in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, you are going to see, uh, Paul made a discovery about himself. A discovery which was consistent with his assignment. And that was how he saw that he was different from Peter. He was different from another functionary that was doing and serving the will of God. Hallelujah. 
Your assignment might be that God gave you. You know, when we talk of prayer, I'm not a baby in prayer. But this woman, I found, <laughs> you know, it's God that allocates grace. Yes. I've seen people that are more anointed than myself that I raised. I don't anoint people. I only disciple people, and God decides what he wants to use them for. And the fact that you may be anointed, more anointed than someone, doesn't mean you have the authority in hands. So we, we will need to talk about clearance levels, about authority, because one of the hallmarks of the entire army is that they don't break ranks. Yes. Hallelujah. So can we do Galatians? He said, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. What did they do? Next verse. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentile. The Bible says that they, it was after this analysis that they gave him a right hand of fellowship. You see, there was a grace that was at work in his life. And the burden, the focus, the emphasis of the endowment that he had, which regulated his affairs, the emphasis was to the Gentiles. He found his assignment. They were all preachers. They could work miracles. They could do signs. But there was an emphasis to the deposits of God on their life. So, each and every one of us that is part of a successful ministry system must know the assignment. And your assignment is part of the responsibility that you are currently shouldering in the house. I can be a pastor of one of the campuses, all right? And I'm doing that. But my assignment might be to be praying for mommy. And she doesn't need to know about it because it's something I'm doing as unto the law. And each and every one of us, you, know, you will not know how much profit, how much corporate profit, and how much corporate rank will result if everyone will attend to his duties and his assignment. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 23 to 25, you will still see Paul giving us a little more insight about what he understood his assignment to be. Um, the issue of assignment is critical. It's critical. That's the reason for which God gives every strand of the allocation of grace that you function in. Um, hallelujah. And meanwhile, if you, be, if you are faithful, God will be increasing the grace of God, his grace upon your life, but it, the, the assignment doesn't really change. So right now, I can do many things. I can prophesy, I can do, but it, you only get more responsibility along the line of your assignment. So more grace might come, more ability might come. Remember, that assignment, that assignment does not change. You will pass through many seasons in the implementation of that assignment, but the assignment itself does not change. So if you know the assignment, you will now realize that you're the only one that is suited under God's grace to prosecute it. And that's why there's no basis for competition. In Colossians chapter 1, it says, if ye continue in faith, are you there, is it? All right, if ye continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached unto every creature which is under heaven, Wherefore, I, Paul, made a minister. There was a challenge. There was a situation that occasioned his being made a minister. So, you see, when you press into God, you begin to find what you were raised to solve. There's a problem. There's a deficiency that you were raised in the body of Christ to solve. An understanding of this is going to put you on the cutting edge. I hope you know, in current statistics in Africa now, Nigeria has the highest number of pastors. In my own opinion, 65% of the people bearing pastors don't know what they are called to do. 
And it's not because God has favorites. It's just because God has intimates. If you stay long enough, you will know your brand. Oh, I wish we had time. We would have talked about some, critical, some more critical organic issues in church life. Right? But let's go. Let's go. Um, number two. So you need to know your assignment. And that's part of your identity. Then you need to know the nature of the enablement that you have. God never gives anyone an assignment without enablement. In fact, it is God himself that is the energy that is required for him to fulfill any assignment he gives you. God himself is the energy. So, yeah, because grace is actually God being factored in the life of a man. Grace is not a thing. Grace is God made available to swallow up all our insufficiencies and our incapacities. So when you understand the kind of enablement that God made available in order for you to be capable of prosecuting your assignment, it gives you an insight into your identity. The difference between the apostles and the other believers in the early church was not the title. The Bible says, great grace was upon them. It was in the measure of grace that they carried. Great grace was upon them. We are in, in a day when, when titles were in a day of titles. But that was not how it was with our ancestors. It was about grace. Please tell your neighbor, Grace. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, we can see, let us investigate into the kind of anointing that Apostle Paul had as we investigate into it. Great grace was upon them. If I give Pastor Soji the microphone, you know, he has this intercessory wiring and he's more of a preacher. He's energetic in his delivery. That's not how I am. And I will, because of grace, you see, what made him like that is the grace that is operating on his life. That grace, what we don't know is that the grace of God that is operating on your life to accomplish God's purpose gives you a unique identity. Now, I might be inspired by Pastor Soyoji's life. In fact, while he's preaching, I might even receive impartations from his anointing. And, and I ultimately may have some semblance with him you understand? Because I tapped something from him. So I might talk a little like him. I might, you know, and all of that. But you see, I cannot be quite like him. So the people that influence your lives, what, what influence is in the kingdom is that you tap into their own economy and you become a partaker of the grace that is upon their land. It's to that extent that you can, they can say, hmm, you look like so this thing called identity, we cannot separate it from the workings of the grace of God that is available to you by covenant in view of your assignment. All right, so 1 Timothy 2 verse 7. Where unto? Can you see the kind of grace on this man's life? I'm, I'm, I'm ordained a preacher. The loudest thing in Paul's life was not that he was a teacher, but it was that he was a preacher. You know, fundamentally, before we, 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 we investigate whether you're an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher or a prophet or an apostle, fundamentally, there is a way you release your unction. When God straps himself to your spirit, there is an approach. There is a way you release your unction. You either release it as a preacher or as a teacher. You see, and they, we need both. No one motivates more than preaching. It, it's like a fire that sets you in motion. And you need that. But you see, the teacher is a grounding, is a grounding anointing. So Paul was more of a preacher. I know you, you, you don't know this. Paul, you know, because he wrote so much of the epistles, we see him as, he was more, in his own description, he was more of a preacher than he was a teacher. He said when he was, he was ordained a preacher, an apostle, 
jump that bracket and teacher. Now, so can you analyze your own life like that? What are you? That we are not talking about your office or how do you express if there is a body strapped upon your heart, how does it come out? Does it come out in form of proclamations to motivate people to stand in line? Or it comes out in form of teaching. It's logical, it's sequential to bring you into an economy of reality and truth. You don't determine that. It, it, is, it, 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 it is determined by the grace that is upon your life. So if we begin to, as we grow in God, the definiteness of the grace that is functional on our life begins to show. And then we begin to see that we are not the same. It begins to show. When you begin to grow in that grace, it begins to show. And then the portrait of the grace of God that is upon your life is fully ma manifested as you mature more in the line of your ordination. So, see, Paul could identify the sequence, he could identify his endowments, he could identify what he was constituted with by God's grace. So, when we know our assignments, it will give us insight into the kind of grace we need. When we begin to prosecute the assignment, then the measure of grace that God allocates to us begins to increase, and that impacts upon our identity. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. Now, for instance, in, in my own opinion, I'm, I'm not a preacher. In order for me, in fact, the major key of my life, I might become, I might do so many things, but I'm a builder. That's, that's what I'm called to do in the body of Christ. I'm a builder. I, the Bible is my textbook. I, my life becomes better when I study the Bible. Because I am wired to build. You might see me on a crusade ground. People get saved and all of that. Yes, I, that grace is there. But the foremost grace of my life is the grace of a builder. I'm sensitive to scriptures. I'm sensitive to the word of God. If the impact it has on me, it maybe it might be deeper than the average believer. Because I'm a builder. That's my shape. We can be in a discussion now, and then we finish the discussion, I go back home. You made a statement, but you don't know. And that statement enters into the software. And for the next seven days, it is generating wisdom. So, and I've discovered that there are some people, if I'm around them, those kind of things happen. So I would like to be around you. As long as those inspirations can come, I don't go out of relevance. So if the inspiration is not coming to me and it's coming through you, it's the same thing. <laughs> yes, just put it in the software. That software of a builder begins to reproduce it. You see, you see, the kind of experiences in God that you have. The other day we were doing some prayers, some prayers, and we we're just speaking in tongue. When the anointing comes on me, what, what, what happens to me is that scriptures will begin to come. That is how I'm wired. Someone else might be seeing visions, like I've had people like that, and they are receiving the word of the Lord. That's not my strongest gift. I prophesy, I see visions. But that's not my strength. That's not. See, when you begin to grow in God, there is a fullness that God begins to bring you into. And you can touch the prophetic, you can touch the teaching, you can touch, you can, there's a fullness. There's a fullness of the capacity. And it doesn't matter which road you, you, you use to come in. <laughs> there's a fullness you'll be able to touch other things and if, if so, but, but you know the, the branch and the stem from whence you derive so that, that's how God shows himself to me, he shows himself to me in scriptures, suddenly my thoughts are hijacked and scripture after scripture, the best concordance is the one that the Holy Spirit generates inside of your heart and life begins to flow. Life begins to flow. Life begins to flow. And sometimes I can leave my study table and I'm just walking on the street. And the, I'm just, I can't, you know, it's just, that's how he appears to me. That's how he comes to me. If you see any other thing happen, that's not my major strength. 
Not my major school. Before all those other things came, I had this one. <coughs> and so, you know, as you move on in God, it now begins to add, but that your substance remains is part of your identity. It shapes you. And if you become strong in it, you will never be dry. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Now, having understood what we call the nature of the grace, we also need to add quietly the measure of the grace. It's another variable. Because, you know, um, hallelujah, the measure of the grace. You can have the same anointing that is upon Pastor B in a different measure. The same oil. But it is functioning in your life in a different measure. You need to know your capabilities that are consistent with the measure that you walk in. Measure. Because that is what is going to determine your authority level. The things that you can actually do by God's grace. Now, I know you know the story. I, I don't want to trouble you. Okay, maybe we need to read it briefly. Um, Second Kings chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Second Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. It means that grace is in measures. Grace is in measures. And... Um, for instance, for those of you that operate in that anointing, if it comes, people get slain. It, there was a time in your life it was not there. It's not because your grace changed. It's just because another measure was added to you. And that's a sign that God considers you faithful. And so he wants to give you more capacity for more responsibility. I want you to know that promotion, that word promotion, if we use it, if we use that word from kingdom perspective, what promotion means is more responsibility. When you get promoted in grace, your coverage will increase. And that means more work. Your reach will increase. So it means that God has given you another measure. So the level of your coverage presently is a function of the measure that you carry. And that measure can be increased if you understand the assignment and you apply yourself to it faithfully. If you are willing to sacrifice in order to see that God is pleased, God will take notice of you and his response to your life is that he's going to increase your measure. So most of the time, hallelujah. It means that, okay, now, I need to show you that if your measure begins to increase, your capacities, your capabilities, your competencies will also increase. If you remember what um, Samuel told Saul, he says, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be changed into another man. I need to explain that. The moment the measure of grace upon your life increases, what happens is that you become different in terms of capacity. Different. It's still you. It's still the same anointing that you have been working in, but you can accomplish much more by the workings of the grace of God upon your life. I remember when I was just a Bible teacher, that was the only grace that was on my life. In order for me to pray, I would take a scripture. I used scriptures to pray. When the prophetic came, 
I could, if I want to go on a trip, on a journey, and I want to check if the road is clear, I can speak in tongues and see the road. It's not because, it's just measure. Some functions will switch on just because there is an increase in the measure. And the only way God will increase your measure is that your life has registered faithfulness. It means the assignment that you were given, you applied yourself to it, and God has profited from your obedience, and now he wants to give you a wider scope of possibility. And what he does is that he increases the measure. Now, you see, I have come to realize, as powerful as publicity is, e-banners, posters, you can name the rest, um, um, and all of that, flex banners, flex banners, and then you just cover the whole corridor. Now, what makes a man relevant? Even I encourage publicity. I encourage you. But what makes a man relevant is the measure. Is the measure. You can actually use e-banners and um, flex banners to generate publicity much more than your measure. You'll not be able to keep. What you invite, you can't keep it. Because you don't have the measure to sustain it. And even if you don't have publicity, if the measure increases, they will come out of the woods. They will come out of the woods, I'm telling you. You know, we are in the north. And um, it's a dry ground. Very dry ground. Uh, when you strike your axe, it will bounce back. So you need to be sure that God sent you there. Because there's nothing about the environment that suggests that it's lucrative. So you just bring faith. Don't, not that you can do anything. Just be bringing faithfulness. A time comes when the measure increases. People will be, I've seen it. People will be compelled to come from strange places. You didn't invite them. They just came. They, there was something that was announced in the spirit. Oh, yeah. Bring faithfulness to the table. Bring faithfulness to the table. You know, I was in public service, um, and uh, before I got into public service, the Lord sent an angel to me. That was the first angelic encounter I had on the 13th of January, 2003. That was the first time I saw an angel with my um, physical eyes. I was praying for one year through my youth service from, you know, we were batch A, so you come in, in January, you finish in December. I started that fast in February, and I finished the year fasting. What, what, what was I fasting for? Okay, Lord, after youth service, what next? He showed me many other things, but he never answered my question. I said, no problem. If you are traveling to Lagos and your fuel finishes in a Ibada, it's not because your car is spoiled. Put more fuel. Hey. January 13th, I started another fast, 2003. It was the first day of the fast. I prayed for like seven hours, eight hours, and he sent an angel to me. And he said, go back to Kano, because I served in Kano. Those were the days of religious riots, and it was not a good place to be. And my dad just died. My mom just became a widow. I told her that I was going back to Kano. The Lord had spoken to me. She didn't allow that. And I said, well, I will not disobey you to obey God. If God, that's what I was taught anyway. I will not disobey you. To obey God. So if God has spoken, God will come to you. Don't worry. Don't worry. You will come. So I now left and was doing my own thing. And then the angel appeared to her in the dream and said, <laughs> So she woke up in the morning and said, Go. So I went back. I went back to he said, he said, go back to Kano. He said, continue discipling people. Because I had some disciples that were coming to me, were doing Bible study and praying, do four hours, eight hours prayer, were just doing all of that. And the number was increasing. And after my youth service, I took my bag and left. He said, go back. You have, you've finished youth service. You've not finished your assignment. Then he now said, if you are faithful, I will come again and I'll give you a job. 
and you will invest in many destinies, and a great network shall be formed. These were the words of an angel of, the, of God. So I went back to Kano, and then I saw my disciples. They bound themselves with a fast. That that copper, bring that copper back. I said, so is this, is this guy, is that, oh my God. Well, started teaching, started teaching, started teaching them how to pray, teaching them scriptures, discipling them, showing them the way of the Lord. The number of the disciples were multiplying. We were doing every Saturday, we start prayer from 8 o'clock to 4 p.m., 8 o'clock to 4 p.m., 8 o'clock to 4 p.m. And then other days, sometimes I close from work by 4 o'clock. I come home, I'm back by 4 o'clock with my tie. I ascend the mountain. I come back, come down by 9. That's where we meet on the mountain. So I, I was doing that. I was lost in doing it because he said I should do it. Then in a fellowship meeting, somebody started prophesying one day that I will give you a job. The same thing he told me. You know, I was not asking for a job. I was just, give me direction. What, where do you want me to do ministry? You have been hunting me to do ministry since I have finished. Where is the way? He said, you are not going into food. <laughs> somebody began to prophesy and said the same thing in my notes. That, you know, I'll give you a job, all of that. It was already there. It was a confirmation. And um, that was August. And then we started preaching in different places, doing deliverance. Sons of the bond woman, they visit us in the night with, with, with their children that are possessed. We cast them out and lead them to Jesus. People will come with that, their thing, and then they will remove it and say, see me, I'm dying. Oh. So we were doing all of that. We're doing all. And then he now leaked that we were doing that. And then they now started looking for me. My name was on one list. And one day I woke up in the morning in prayer. And Holy Spirit said, you know what? Take your bag and leave. And we are enjoying this thing. You say we should come here. Leave. So I went and resigned. Took my bag. Said bye. I was wondering. Got back again. Started fast. I said, what's happening? What's happening? I just got to Abuja. My employment came up. So in that employment, he told me what to do. He said, you will invest in many destinies. That's how I started paying school fees of widows. Widows, children. Once he gives me salary, I'll be looking for where to cast the seed. He will tell me. So I did that for five years. And for five years, I was not promoted. The reason was because one of our chief executives came to town and he wanted me to go to campus to bring girls for him. I said, this campus, I was a, an evangelist on this. <laughs> I was an evangelist here. If I go back now, attempting to, to get girls for you, they will think Jesus has started another trick. Because they know me, they know me. I was a, a terror. I afflicted the campus with the gospel. So, uh, well, oh manager, this is an impossibility. I can't do that. So he now said, well, I will face the consequences. I say, I don't mind, I don't mind. I knew Jesus before I got this job. So that, that now pained him. So I was not promoted for five years. I went on 48 hours prayer one day and said, did I fail you? I brought, see, this is what he said I should do. Did I fail when I said that to God, one week later, our chief executive came to visit me. So we're doing well, asked me questions, I answered him. He went back, he couldn't sleep. Call that guy. That guy is the admin guy. Bring that boy's fire. You didn't, you have not promoted this boy. That's how he asked that guy. Write a letter now, that is in June. Would they promote people in January? The guy, the same guy that said I will not be promoted, wrote a letter, signed it, and then the next, and they backdated my promotion four years, yeah. and then, uh, and then, uh, the man asked again the next year because I was due. That boy, again. So the man that said I will not be promoted, his signature was on two of my promotion letters. Now, the question is, when he was signing, was he looking like this or like this? Oh, 
the God, when he increases the measure, eh, the prayers and the breakthroughs you are looking for, just when he increases the measure, it turns things around. Just the measure. That's the formula for breakthrough, that the measure increase. So some things that were illegally holding you just lost grip of your life. Yeah. When he increases it, we're going to pray. Can we ask God that? Uh, do, you know, do you know what? It doesn't take long for God to approve you for promotion. If only you are ready and willing and you are saying, I'm going to be faithful. During the course of ministry this year, I'm going to be faithful because I am trusting you for an increase in measure. I was kept without promotion for five years. Nothing happened. The moment the measure increased, everything that a man did, God used the hand of that man to reverse it. And I trust God that everything that men have done to limit your possibility because of the increased heightened measure of the grace of God that is coming upon your life, it will be reversed in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The level of authority that you wield is dependent on your measure. Oh Lord, I seek a higher measure. I know that what I'm experiencing at the moment is not the best that you have. There are dimensions of grace. There are dimensions of anointing. There are dimensions of possibilities. I want to climb higher. It is my intention to reach higher in the ladder of grace. There are bondages, limitations that hang around my life that cannot stand my life if I have a higher measure. I reach to the stars. I reach to the heights of heaven. I reach for grace. I reach for higher possibilities. I ask, oh God, that you strengthen me with might by your spirit in the inner man. Let, oh God, my light become intense. It is written that Gentiles will come into my light, but kings will come into the brightness of my rising i want to shine bright i want to attract kings kings will come Kaubasimolonte. <laughs> Eko pasko falamasa, eko bresko belaita koma, isozela apata mantala baboria, eskovria la babonte me, akabo si ko bresko balatoa. Gentiles will come into your light, but kings will only be attracted by the brightness of your rising. It is time to shine bright. The kings must see the witness coming from your life. And they must be attracted to the kingdom of God. There are many kings in, in Lekki. So many accomplished people. It will take the brightness of your rising to attract them to the Lord. It will take an intensity of the hand of God that is upon your life to turn your heart, your hearts from darkness to light. We can no longer burn low. We can no longer burn low. There is an intensity. There is an intensity that we must reach for. There is an intensity that we must lay hold upon. God is not true with you yet. This is not the best that you can be. You are in a dangerous competition with yourself. Because anytime the grace comes, you are turned into another man. We shall be changed. You will wear a stronger anointing. You will carry a heavier grace. And your life will turn. Even those that are caught up in the 
darkest of darkness they will see the illumination of the grace of God coming through your vessel oh my God seal presco be kabuko tamakante yamo seke taboka bro ah so mina kapreska there is a break and forth there is a break and forth on the left on the right there is a movement there is a movement in the spirit god is going to use you like never before he will use you to plant things that never existed to approve things that he has not planted this is the day of the lord god is returning to the church in nigeria to raise among his people a functionary a witness that will bring the kingdom of darkness down hey so Braske kopo kombeli, ala kopresko vila makabase, semina kanto kompelama, braka teskovi, sema koriate, ampresko vala mana, ebroska belaita, iya kabo seketala, ibraka peko bela masantala, isko bela muko, isko planta babokota. Is called he is willing to give you another measure he will open unto you a strong perception a mighty prophetic anointing you will be able to know when to take your journey when to stand when to sit when to walk away and when to run his grace will make you wise by the holy ghost ah kevosi baluata Let's come at 2022 will be different. It will be different. It will be different. Oh my God. Baro Besik. Endo Mesik. Braska Bokota Makantele. Rabo Sakataya. Embraka Beskobelata. Ikos Kenzo Sanakunde. Abraka Bakuda Bakua. Bresco Faleme, Yata Compreskid, Ingo Samakur, a Bresco Valame, Zamenaita, 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 La Bracaba, Ico Pacabosa, La Trosquetoboco, Mantella Icoma, Asai Tokela. Yes, in your assignment, everything that has to do with your destiny is factored into your assignment receive grace from the lord to stand at the gates that you have been appointed and to bring faithfulness to the table to to draw from god to prosecute your assignment god will make you strong he will cause your face to shine he will undo the things that limit you because this is the year of the lord he comes with grace he comes with glory to extend our borders to extend our coverage to extend our reach oh the hand of god is upon you the hand of god is upon you i soko malaba preska boko petakuda asamaka preskaila rabo semen apesila in a moment can you ask him more grace more grace more grace more grace more grace more grace ah kobo seliata e baka bakusketa e briko patwa a little one shall become a thousand and a small one shall become a strong nation do thy beginning be small thy later end it shall greatly increase for the hand of god comes upon your life the hand of god comes upon your life and you shall be changed into another man you shall be transformed into another man grace upon grace grace upon grace oh his hand is upon you come on maliata prescove Avalaboska, Laminataya, Prokopelakus Kembe, 
Ratus kapu da makabala Brate sopo kobe lakila Ah He comes to strengthen, to energize you He comes, he comes He comes to take away every weakness Every insufficiency He swallows it up this morning He swallows it up He swallows it up 